Hello, my name is Danny Nolan and I'm the Director of Chassis Sim Technologies and welcome to this latest episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk to you about something that's very, very important. In particular, what I want to talk to you about is simulation and race car tuning because this is one of these topics that we in the simulation community, in particular the race car simulation community, I don't think have, have properly addressed. And I was having an email with a few customers about this topic, and particularly some newer customers. I could see they were getting into a few potholes with this. So really, this is why this tutorial has been born. So let's set the scene. When we talk about simulation, we focus a lot, and quite correctly, on correlation. Because quite frankly, if you don't have a correlated model, then in particular, if your simulation, uh, if the simulation engine doesn't have the appropriate fidelity um, to match those changes, then quite frankly, all you're doing is just guessing. But one of the things that we in the simula in the race car simulation community have done a very, very bad job of is that typically we'll focus on correlation, then we'll throw you the simulator, and then we'll go off and just say, all right, off you go and knock yourself out. But without providing the appropriate context about where the limits of the sandbox are and what you should be playing uh, with. So what we're going to talk about in this tutorial is we're going to talk to you about some rules of thumb about how to use the simulation and why those rules of thumb exists. And um, what we're then going to do is to give you a little bit more context of where this all comes from. So let's get started. First things first, you've got to know what you're dealing with and the more importantly, the limits of what you're dealing with. If we take a look at most of the tire models that you're going to be you, be dealing with is mostly they're going to be 2D tire models and um, they'll be bas uh, they'll be curves that looks lo uh, that look like this. And this is a um, uh, uh, this is an illustration of a tr of a second order traction circle um, uh, uh, radius versus um, uh, load tire model. Now here's the thing: models like this are fantastic for car uh, are fantastic for correlation. They also do a very good job of giving you a really good handle of where you need to be in terms of race car handling. And I've talked about that in a number of other um, different tutorials. However, where these tire models will fall down is where they'll fall down is when you start taking setup values that are well uh, that are well out of the scope of what you have just modeled. For example, if this comes from, say, a, um, uh, if this, say, comes from a car with wheel rates, of say 150 newton millimeters front and rear if we all of a sudden start shoving in 50 newton millimeter um, uh, 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 wheel rates say at the rear and we keep the 150 at the front all of a sudden we've pushed that tire model into an area we don't know about it so consequently all you're doing is guessing and that ladies and gentlemen is probably the biggest trap that i see for novice simulation users also too, how do you go about using simulation? So what I really want to talk to you about, about um, how to use simulation is an example from uh, what I used to use back in the, uh, what I used to use back in the day. As many of you who tune into this channel know, uh, one of my pastimes is that I fly radio controlled um, electric powered aircraft. Now, back in the day when everyone was still getting um, their heads around, you know, what motors they should use, what prop combinations they, they would use, um, there were all sorts of uh, programs that came out to um, help you. One particular program I used was called ElectroCalc, and what you're seeing here is something called eCalc, which is a modern spiritual successor. Now, here's the rub. What I would often do is I would have a rough rule of thumb of um, how my planes would uh, of how my planes would uh, perform. I would know the spec of the motor because that was pro uh, that was relatively easy because that was well known. So you would know the KV of the motor, the um, resistance of the coils, etc., etc. What wasn't known was some of the aerodynamic characteristics. So what I would often do is that I would manipulate the numbers in the simulation package to get the performance figures to where I needed to be. Once I had those performance figures where I needed to be, then I could start playing around with things like prop sizes and motor specifications. Now, 
that actually worked fairly well. I mean, when I um, uh, uh, when I was playing around an awful lot with uh, with motors, when I used that approach, I was pretty much always within about far uh, with about five to ten percent. But that really rams home the point, ladies and uh, ladies and gentlemen. You use your simulator as a calculator. You can't use it as a magic wand, and I've really got to ram home that that ram home that point because one of the big traps that I see with race car simulation is that everyone tr is that a lot of uh, is that a lot of users try to use race car simulation as a magic wand. A race car simulation has many tools. A magic wand, it is not. You must treat it like a calculator, and I cannot stress that point enough. Some other rules of thumb of how to use simulation. One of the, and let me preface this um, uh, by saying that a colleague of mine once said to me, one of the best things you did and the worst things you did at the same time was putting a lap time number of what chassis sim would do. It was a good thing in the fact that it, it gave some scope to what the simulation would do. It was a bad thing in the fact that all of a sudden everyone would just go lap time, lap time, lap time. This is an example of how you use the lap time simulation where actually couldn't give a stuff about what the actual lap time is. What I was doing here was I was doing some work for a time attack customer where all I was focused on was um, rod height calculations, and in particular, take a look at this bottom, uh, take a look at these channels here: front ride height, rear ride height, and the bump rubber dis uh, and um, the bump rubber displacement. Here, what I was doing was that I was going through and taking a look at right. This is approximately where I know the performance is going to be. What are the bump rubbers? How do I spec out the bump rubber to make sure the thing isn't bottoming on the ground? And I actually use this to actually design the bump rubber arrangement for this car. Now that is a really, really important example of how you use simulation to focus on a particular area that you're, interest, uh, that you're interested in. And that's actually a little tip that I got from my US dealer, um, John Hayes, because like everyone else, I actually got sucked into the whole um, lap time um, to, uh, to, you know, got overly focused on the lap time that chassis sim um, would be um, putting out. Fortunately, I'm surrounded by a lot of good people who can sometimes snap me out of this. But again, this really illustrates how you use a simulator as a calculator as opposed to a magic wand. Okay, so what are the parameters you should be working with? Because particularly for novice simulation users or those who are who've got some very, very screwed up ideas on what a simulator can be. The biggest mistake that I see is that you start throwing all sorts of crazy numbers at the simulator. And then when it doesn't work, people tend to throw their toys out of the pram and have temper tantrums. So here are some really good rules of thumbs in terms of the parameters you should be working with. Spring rates, plus or minus 20% off the base setup. Keep damping ratios to known values of the base um, setup. With regards to damping ratios, particularly with what we've learned with the Shaker Rig Toolbox, you can be a little bit more aggressive on this. But as a rough rule of thumb, just remember an awful lot of what you'll do with the damper isn't just about the ride height platform, it's about tuning the handling, it's also about getting temperature into the tire. So while you can be a little bit aggressive um, with the damping ratios, don't go totally stupid. Suspension geometry, again, like with spring rates, plus or, uh, plus or minus 20% of the roll center migration. That being said, one thing I can say is that if you particularly, if you're playing around with different um, suspension geometry configurations to make sure that the camber gain um, in braking and cornering is sensible, this is actually something that you can lean on, um, uh, lean on quite a bit. I can't speak for my competitors, but uh, the stuff in chassis sim has been validated in the KNC rig, so this is something that you can be quite aggressive on. Bars within plus or minus 30 degrees of 30% of, um, uh, of the base setup. Also, too, and I cannot stress this point enough, start from a well-known model and modify to suit. You do not get brownie points for showing how academically brilliant you are by starting from scratch. There's a good reason why in Chassis Sim, when you install Chassis Sim, we've got a whole bunch of templates there. We just don't do that for our own academic amusement. We do that so that you have got a good base model to work with. And ultimately, if you're a new user using Chassis Sim for the first time and you don't know where to start, 
Don't suffer in silence. There's a wonderful thing called email. Don't hesitate in emailing us. That being said, there is one channel you need to be watching like a hawk, and that is the stability index because it tells you about drivability. As I commented in one of my other videos, just remember, all race car engineering revolves around two things, grip and drivability. And in particular, this particular example of a front wing change of a um, on a Formula 3 car really illustrates what you get from simulation and in particular um, how for example if you take a look at the steering trace here right there's uh, uh, the the baseline is colored um, the front wing change forward is um, uh, is black so you can see here there's not a lot of changes in terms of the steering changes that being said it's really showing up here in the stability index there there's been like a three percent change further forward so particularly when you start making all these changes don't just watch the lap time getting quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker look at what's happening with the stability index and the other thing that i'll also say is that you can incorporate stability index in the lap time uh, calculation but i've sort of left that as the discretion of the user that being said don't leave home without this also, too, while I'm sort of touching upon another video that I did, given the nature of what we're discussing here, it's really important to review this in, to, in terms of evaluating what you're getting back from the simulator. Just remember, changes on the simulator will always be smaller than the actual car. And here, is a good, uh, here are some good ideas of what to look for. 0.1 to 0.2k an hour, that's a mild change. 0.2 to 0.6k an hour, that's a moderate change. 0.6k an hour, well, that's a hallelujah be praise change, or, uh, or oh my word, I have really screwed up here. The other thing too, ladies and gentlemen, is you're always looking for small and consistent changes. If the, uh, So for example, this is an example of a good, small, consistent change where I did a setup change, it was looking pretty good here, but then all of a sudden it lost out here. When I look at something like that, I go, okay, you know what, that's sensible. If I'm looking at a C time plot that's going flat, 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 and it goes boom, and then uh, flat, uh, flattens out like that, I know that that's a bit of a furphy. So that's a really important thing to consider. Correlation, what to focus on. And the only reason I'm mentioning this again because one of our most viewed videos is how to interpret simulated race data. But I really need to ram home for this because a big trap for young players is that I get people so wrapped up in correlation that they will spend three to four, sometimes six months in correlation and not actually using the, uh, uh, and not actually using, um, the simulator. Remember, all a simulator is, it's a calculator, it's a representative environment. And here are some r rough rules of thumbs you, you should be focusing on. 80 to 120k an hour, if the delta is 1 to 2k, that's good enough. 120 to 160, 2 to 3k an hour, that's good enough. 160k an hour plus, you're looking about 3 to 4k an hour. If you are in that window, particularly for a road course, you're laughing. The, other, the exception that proves that rule is ovals, but we can talk about that at another time. The other thing too, in terms of correlation, this is good enough. This is an example of chassis sim versus an amateur uh, of chassis sim versus an amateur driver uh, of chassis sim versus an amateur driver with a little bit of talent. That correlation there, ladies and gentlemen, was more than sufficient for that uh, um, uh, for that team to make very good strides both in suspension geometry and um, in damper selection. So really. That's something I really want you guys to take to heart. The other thing too, and this is the other thing that I always say in the, in the chassis and boot camps, correlation is a consequence. It's not the end result. If correlation is the consequence, you will all, uh, 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 you will, uh, uh, you, and if you've done the right thing by focusing on your tire model, your error model, correlation is a byproduct. But if you're looking for correlation as the holy grail, you will be forever doomed to disappointment. Now, some conclusions and reflections. Remember, I cannot stress this point enough. Simulators are calculators, they are not magic wands. Now, due to the nature of, also to, due to the nature of the tire model, just remember, huge setup changes are not going to work. You might get lucky, but as a rough rule of thumb, if you start doing huge deltas on setup changes, um, it, 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 you, know, you will be forever doomed to, uh, uh, to disappointment. The key is, you focus on small derivations from the current setup, you focus on the stability and the driver channels. The other thing too to ram home is that 
the simulated changes will always be smaller than actual changes. But I cannot stress enough, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll look close on this note. If you treat a simulator, a race car simulator, as a calculator, as something to inform you of where to go, you'll have a very, very powerful tool. However, if you treat it as a magic wand that will instantly give you something that's three seconds a lap um, uh, quicker, you'll be always um, doomed to disappointment. We'll conclude it on that note, and we'll check you out on the next episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Course.